Hi, I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager here at Hopkins Center for the Arts. We're speaking with artists Gene Haughton and Shelby Meyerhoff about their exhibition, Beyond and Bizarre, Natural Illusions. Shelby? Hi. Gene, welcome. Thank thanks you. for being here and thanks for sharing your work with us. Yeah, thank you. It's um, a real pleasure. Thank you. Both of you approach uh, your work um, with a, a theme of transformation. Uh, is that fair to say? I, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Um, well, your pictures don't look like exactly like you, so you have been transformed. There so. you yeah. go. Yeah. And uh, Jean, you transform women's wearables. Is that that's fair to say? Um, where does this uh, inspiration come from uh, for each of you? Inspiration, or sometimes I think of that word as influence. Maybe they don't, they don't mean necessarily the same thing, but sometimes sure. I think of uh, I was influenced or inspired by uh, things that happened to me in, in the, my past, the uh, garments, uh, the sewing and so forth, that I, when I was a young child. So um, remembering that, and when I ever go into any shop, uh, uh, vintage shop or things like that, I, I get um, excited about what I see. Uh, so, um, and uh, you can say even fiber and things like that uh, inspire me. You know, certain artists that we might talk about later on inspire me. And so it's kind of, and nature, so it's kind of mm -hmm. broad. Yeah, yeah. Shelby. Yeah, I love that you mentioned nature because that's the theme of our yes. show. <laughs> and. Um, I mean, I think something that's so interesting to me is that both Jean and I are deeply inspired by nature, and we're both coming at this as women and women who've had um, a lifetime of, you know, dressing and changing and presenting. And um, so, for me, usually my starting point is a walk in the woods near my house. That that's mm -hmm. often where I feel most free to really um, be as I am. And then the kind of transformations that come from that feel both fantastical and sort of deeply personal and meaningful for me. And mine kind of uh, goes more into the, uh, the the woman or the personality, and not necessarily the the, the depth, but just the well, the character of the person. But in terms of nature, I'm a, uh, one of my second loves is is gardening, and I always have been uh, um, enjoying designing in the outside environment and so that's kind of my connection to the arts and or to the nature and, and that because it's involving colors and placements and discoveries of plant forms and so forth and that. I mean it's really endless what you can find there, yeah. right? How do you each uh, identify yourselves as artists? Um, because there's elements about both your work that are the um, l certainly less expected uh, as far as um, the the process. Uh, S Shelby, you uh, paint uh, your face and photograph yourself. Um, it seems like part of it is uh, almost performative. Do you consider it that way? Yes, I have actually been branching recently into performance, so into performing live, into, to, and initially into painting on myself and in front of other people. And initially I thought of that as more like a demo. Yeah. But what I realized as I was doing it recently is, well, there is actually an embodiment going on here. It's, it is a kind of transformation that takes place. Um, and so in that sense, I feel like it, it is performative. Um, I think something that I sometimes uh, sort of find myself resisting is the tendency to put it in the category of purely performance because there is something that happens in the magic of the moment when the photograph is taken where the photograph seems to complete the work. So at least at this stage in my, in my development as an artist, I think about it as the painting and the, the performance or the embodiment, the becoming, and the photography are all sort of working together in this this magic moment. And so I really um, 
uh, stand as a multidisciplinary artist. And that's, that's how I describe the work, to say that each of these pieces is really integral to um, the experience that, that I have and the experience for the viewer. It would be too reductive to, to say photographer. Certainly that would miss a crucial element, not only of the painting, but of the, the process of performance. On the other hand, I think um, sometimes there's that folks have asked, well, is this really just the performance that you've then documented with a picture? And I always want to say, no, I mean, what you're seeing when you see a photograph is the is the the magic moment there and it's not it's not that the photograph is a post hoc documentation it's that there really is something that happens when all three elements come together Jean how about you it's almost opposite you know your process is is shorter in length when you do your mm. face and my process or discovery is spread out over mm. months uh, Take, for example, um, my one uh, hat uh, rarely came out of her shell. Uh, when I bought the hat, the vintage hat, it was um, right away it said turtle to me. Mm. And so um, sometimes when I look at things or garments, I don't know what is going to happen with it or what, I'm, what direction I'm going to go until I, uh, you know, let it sit there for a while. But Turtles, but then the, when I talk about process, which is kind of a long process, I um, thought about the hat, uh, the, the the turtle that is um, that you find in the ocean, mm. and that the, the hard shell turtle, and I was thinking about you know the pattern and so forth, and so I go to the library, I get books and so forth, and and do some research mm. on whatever creature or nature or whatever I'm doing at that time. But I, when I started it, I didn't, I thought I wasn't pretty pleased, and so I'm, I oftentimes step back and mm -hmm. start again on my work. And uh, so in, in the discovery of the turtles, I discovered that there was such a thing as a river turtle and never knew that, and that they're soft-shelled. And the more I looked at that hat, I thought that is more, that's better for um, a soft-shelled turtle. Mm -hmm. And so then I have to be concerned with how to, they're spiny, how to build the spine and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, I had some fabric that I had uh, loomed on a five, five harness loom uh, in college that I hadn't used and I decided to use it on it. But I wanted the face. And I thought, well, I can make it out of clay. And uh, then I, well, no, you know. Well, my daughter, when she left home from, for college, they always leave things behind. Sometimes too many things in the closet. What am I going to do with all that? She had some dolls. So I thought, well, maybe I can take a face. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went up, uh, and, and this one doll, the hair just disintegrated. So I knew it wasn't really very good anymore. So I called my daughter. I said, is it OK if I use, and I described the doll. And she says, you mean Camille? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I'm in trouble because she's got a name on this doll. And I, I told her the hair isn't good anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so she says, yes, you may use it. So the Dremel drill came out, and, uh, and that was uh, the start of, uh, so it's, it's a long, long process until I get to the finished piece, mm -hmm. and I have step backs and step forwards. So it's a totally different kind of mm -hmm. discovery that I, I go about and, and, and the doll that I, uh, that I use had blue eyes. You know, turtles has to have green eyes. Mm -hmm. uh. So the, the eyes come out and then I have to find a source sure. for something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's different how we each get to our end, but it's... Well, I actually, you might be surprised because I, I th although my process for any final image is like eight hours or less of you know, painting and photographing it's often months or even right. Right. like the tree frog I've worked on a couple years I would sure. keep coming back to the tree frog and I loved what you said about like you really look closely at that living thing and try to figure out okay I need a spine but how's mm -hmm. that gonna work because that is sort of what I do too right I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out okay it's gonna be like tree bark but it's gonna be a, you know how am I gonna take the thing I'm working with 
and transform it in, into something else from the natural world in a way that's faithful mm -hmm. to what makes that thing distinctive. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I see a lot of um, a lot of similarity too. And it's like you know, if I ask them when they look at some of my pieces, and they say, you know, what kind of animal do you think that is, and they, and they all say well, it looks like. And that's usually when I make something, I don't want it to be photographic image of that thing. I want it to have the characteristics yeah, of, of exactly. that uh, uh, creature. I'm not out to try to exactly get the nose right or the uh, the beak or the fur or whatever. I, I want it to have the, the characteristics of but that. But you want there to be that moment yeah. where someone looks and goes, yeah. oh, yeah. crab. I'm, I'm curious um, how strategic each of your um, processes are versus uh, responsive or what proportion that is. Because uh, Jean, you're working with found garments and I wonder if you have something in mind like that. And uh, Shelby, with you, I imagine that you planned out uh, at least to a certain degree um, how you will paint yourself, um, but are there choices that are made mid painting process uh, or is it very very planned um, can you speak to process and how you make decisions if it's kind of pre-making or as you're doing as well does that make sense yeah. well, you know the interesting thing about garments or hats or shoes or whatever they they each have a, a certain kind of um, element about them. Uh, and when I work with garments, mostly in the 40s or the 60s, it's the cut of the piece. It's a, it's a pocket. It's a, uh, the, a cuff or a collar or something like that, or, or, a, or a release pleat on a, on a skirt that uh, I sometimes, uh, after looking at it for a while, I, ma I can make a connection with something. Sure. And then, it, then I go off. And that, uh, when, once I make that connection, oh great, I've solved it, you know, and I go off, but then I, um, I can have step backs too. But the, it's, it's what I see or, or the texture of the, which is the nature of fiber in itself, and the, and the style of the, uh, of the garment, uh, which already gives you a starting point versus a, a blank piece of white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got uh, I've got something there that I can begin with and get excited about. Do you know when when you discover that piece? Where, uh, and are you shopping at thrift stores or online? Or how do you how do you, how are you sourcing these? Or is that a trade not, secret? Not, a, not a, I don't. <laughs> not, no. In fact, some of the places that I have enjoy, I have told other people. So I'm not. Uh, um, but the, not thrift stores, but there is a, a certain store uh, or two in the Twin Cities that really have um, uh, designer type uh, clothes where okay. uh, you can get the, you know, and like I said, I enjoy the 40s, the 60s, to get more excited over that than you do something out of the, uh, or what can I do with a mini skirt sure. you know, out of the 80s. That's yeah. a tough one. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, that's where, and and I have a, I have a big stockpile at home. I call it a, well. If I'm not going to use it now, I just add it to my stockpile. Sure. And so those are that's my inspirations too, because I you know I'm looking for uh, an eyelid or or something like that. Okay, I've got selvages off the edge of the fabric. I've kept. I've I've got all these little things that are pieces of little metal or jewelry or whatever that I never know. Yeah. It might work, and sure. so um, a lot of the things I find already in my sock bag. Or if I go to a fabric store, and I love going to uh, fabric stores, especially for, for the the natural fibers, and if uh, and I'll buy it because I like the color and the fiber, and the texture, and so forth. Not necessarily something in mind, but I'll just it's there for later on to to use. Sure. And Shelby, do you have uh, uh, an animal or uh, an, um, an element of the natural world? Because it isn't always an animal. There's uh, autumn leaf. Uh, do you have those um, elements in mind as you go forward, like 
this is going to be the blue ringed octopus? Mm. Or how do you arrive at that subject? And do you develop the painting through preparatory drawings or uh, trial and error? Or how does that work? Some of both. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I usually know going in what the thing is that I've been thinking about, what living thing has been on my mind, or even right ocean waves or some, a place, the evening forest, something that um, I've had a direct encounter with or for some reason it's starting to have a hold on me or it's speaking to me. And um, once I have that, then often I am doing preparatory drawings, um, looking at photographs, or, or when I can, taking my own reference photos. So I'm almost, I almost never work without a photograph in front of me. Um, so when I started, I used to just kind of let things flow entirely. You know, it would be like, OK, I'm thinking dragonfly, but it might turn out wildly different, and that one did, than I anticipated. And, um, but there was a point when I was working on the monarch butterfly, so I think that was 2019, where I made it, I painted myself as a monarch butterfly. We have them in our front yard sometimes. It didn't work. I did it again. <laughs> they took all these photographs. It still didn't work. And finally, before the third one, I said, I said this is, you know, uh, something has to change in this process. Sure. And um, I imported a photograph of myself into an iPad and then got out my, my sketching tool and actually drew, like, okay, this is how this design is going to, this is where it's going to be on the eyes, this is what's going to be on the cheek. And it turned out to make a huge difference. So I really believe in the work, in following the work. In other words, I don't think things can be forced or that, um, I think over planning is kind of the, the death of the really wonderful um, impulse. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think all of these tools can help us kind of achieve what we're really dreaming about being able to do. And when you identified that the earlier iterations or, or attempts at the monarch weren't working, was it, how were you basing, what metrics on which, uh, uh, what metrics were you using to base that? Was it a feeling or was it intuitive or was it, what, what was not working? Can you well, say? Yeah, I think it goes back to what Jean and I were talking about earlier. So after, I always say don't stop the process in the middle. So even if I'm painting and I'm thinking this isn't going to work out, just keep going. And so I always go through, you say, hundreds of photographs, whether or not I think that, that it's going to come together. Because sometimes it sort of does, like there's a surprise. Um, but I was looking at the contact sheets for the first one and then again for the second. And I was like, at no point do I feel that I'm looking at anything like a butterfly. You know, it doesn't, something isn't there, that spark of recognition. And there's also a sense of presence in the pieces. So it has to be, what I'm looking for in a contact sheet for a final image is something where it feels like that creature, where there's a spark of aliveness in me that is resonating that I have to be kind of be both viewer and uh, um, performer at that moment afterwards and say, do I as a viewer feel something when I see this, a, a kind of connection? And then is the painting and the photography holding up in a technical sense? Does it feel um, fully realized? Hmm. Did you begin as a photographer or did you begin as one who performs and paints faces? And so I painted like on and off my whole life. Like I was always sort of picking up a paintbrush and so periods of life very intensely. And then other times I'd set it aside. I took a lot of classes, um, but I'd never had a body of work like this. And I also had always been a theater performer. And it's only like, it, it, I should say rather not always, but I had done a lot of performance when I was younger. And then I'd always been drawn to public speaking roles in my professional life, um, not as an artist. And it's only recently, as people have asked more and more about performance, that I've started to realize, you know, all those years of, of being in theater and then doing public speaking, like they really have come into the work without me even being conscious of it mm. at first. So the photography came last, and um, I took a lot of classes, and it was, it was a real um, journey to say, I'm going to have to learn a totally new skill to make this work what it can be. And it's, um, 
it's been humbling and also exciting to be like, I really am going to have to train up if I want to make this um, really be successful. Um, and, it, and I think it's, it's now something that I feel fluent in and that I feel um, excited about continuing to experiment with and push. Gene, how about you? Where, where, did, where did your, pro, where did your, uh, um, your practice emerge from? Well, it dates way back. Yeah. <laughs> you, which was a, a intro to that question uh, that, um, you know, before I, when I graduated from high school, I uh, was going to, and I already, I graduated from the University of Minnesota, but when I entered, I was going to be a uh, major in clothing and textiles, fashion merchandising. And uh, before I entered college, I changed my major to art education. But uh, while I'm teaching, uh, my interest, uh, you're a jack of all trades when you're an art teacher in terms of uh, the mediums that you have to do. But I always went back to fiber because fiber was in my uh, life at a young age. So. If I can share, can I share my Sure, story? please. Oh my gosh. This is the uh, journal uh, titled uh, Recounting My Sewing Years with My Mother. And um, it, uh, uh, there's my mother and there's me. Uh, I have a entry in here that I oftentimes share with other people. And uh, it's kind of, it's the beginning of where my interest of fiber came in. And it's called Seven. Even though I was raised on a farm, most of my early memories of my surroundings were inside my home. People with fair skin have a tendency to stay inside more or look like they've st stayed inside more. And by the time I was nine years old, I had mastered darning socks, putting a knee patch on a pair of pants, the authentic kind, not the press on of today, and hemming dish towels. I had even made a scrapbook of all different kinds of seams and seam finishes. I was ready to take the plunge of sewing the gathered skirt. Of course, I was already familiar with the sewing machine, and at an earlier age, I put the needle through my finger. It started going pretty weirdly at the start on the skirt. All those straight seams, straight hem edges, straight gathering stitches. No trouble with that tape guide mother had put on the sewing machine. I was ready for the next step, the zipper. No longer could I use the tape guide. I was on my own. And what took place next is indelibly pressed into my mind. It was the final part of the zipper sewing the top stitching, the part that showed. First, it was crooked, and I had trouble going around the lock. Ripped it out a couple times. Not too bad yet, but I hate to rip, or I did then. By the fifth time, my mother had ruled a pencil line on top of my fabric, and by that time, my mother didn't seem to mind ripping. She had always had more patience. By the seventh time, and what did become the last time, I had what seemed to be a worn path to follow. And later, as I often thought back on that memory, I have envisioned the teeth of that zipper beginning, becoming that of some creature and how I tackled it before it got me. The next year, I did snaps. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's kind of, you know, when I read that, it, it kind of says what I, what I am right now, you know, because I'm a, I, I keep on wanting to do something and something until it's right. And, and, I, and if, it, if I don't feel good about something, I keep on, or I want to change my route that I'm going, I, I step back and, no, that didn't work out. I'll do something different. And, and I, I, I work at it until I have it right. I don't know if I want to call myself a perfectionist, but I just, I, my end product, I have to be happy with it. Mm -hmm. And so. How do you know when a work is done? After a lot of months, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. um, I don't know. You know, it, it's hard to say because 
I will have done something and I think I like it. And then I, then I say, no, I, I, it's not, the, not the, what I wanted. Maybe the color isn't quite right. So I, I, do, I do a lot of re-dyeing or over-dyeing. And so I have to tweak something or, 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 or maybe change the color of my thread or uh, something like that. Or I discover in my stockpile something else that was a better solution to my problem. I, and I always call them problems to solve. When I was a teacher, I always called uh, the, my, the problems, well, I, gave, I called them problems that they had to solve. And so mm -hmm. I see my, the, the, the garment that I brought home from the store or whatever, it's a problem that I have to work through and, and try to solve. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say until when I know it's done. It, I guess it's just a feeling mm -hmm. that I know. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, sure. I'm happy with it. Relatedly, Shelby, I know that the images um, here on display were the result of shoots where you took and, and seemed to try out a number of different views and crops, and I've seen some of the contact sheets. Um, how many images do you tend to shoot, if, if, if you can share, before you find the one that is the one? And, and how do you know? So I usually will shoot something like 300, maybe 400. I mean, it just really varies. I usually overshoot. I found it makes a lot, it's much easier to shoot in a place where it can immediately preview on a large monitor. That looking through a viewfinder on a camera does not tell me what I need to know. Um, so often I'll shoot a bunch go look, shoot a bunch more, kind of, I found the sooner I kind of check in with how things are going rather than shooting, say, 400 straight, the better. Um, so I am like looking for that moment of, oh, like I should feel something when I look at it. And often it's not, um, it's not just a head decision, like it's a, it's a heart decision. And I'm, um, and even when I see it, I might just be like, I think I'll just shoot 100 more because I'm going to wash this off, right? And if tomorrow I think, oh, you know, maybe it's not that one after all. I want to have a lot to choose from. But I will say, I feel like um, I, I think that I've gotten more skilled at looking over time. You know, I still have um, critique groups and people who, you know, give me a guidance on how the images are resonating for them. But I find that in the last year or so, if I'm looking at, you know, that one out of 400 that's the right one, like, I usually feel it. And when I look again, it's still, it's still holding me. So for any given subject yeah. in your work, uh, be it a mallard duck or a birch tree, is that the one image of that particular subject and that, that paint uh, um, job, if I, right. if I can say that, um, that you will ever present or might you um, choose additional images from that shoot or alternatively uh, a different um, and I I don't mean to minimize it when I say paint job right. but is that does yeah. that make sense that does that helps yeah. me thank you um, yeah I think that once I've created that you know I've created those 400 images or so and then I've picked that one it kind of becomes for me canonical, that I can't imagine the mallard duck being other than that mallard duck. Um, it just starts to have a hold on me. Um, I think there's one time that I've picked something uh, from a shoot and lived with it for a while and then gone back and been like, actually, it was a different, it was a different image. Sure. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, it was the owl. And I think what happened was I took like a solid almost 14 months in which I made only like one image. It was the uh, mandarin fish. This was during the time between when the pandemic started and when we were vaccinated. And I was home with my toddler and um, wasn't able to do those long stretches. And I came back to that shoot. I think it must have been like a year or two later looking at it and went, oh my gosh, I see now that there had been two I was choosing between and I chose the other. Mm -hmm. But every other piece in the series has been like once it um, speaks to me, then it, it kind of takes on a life. And I think I was thinking about the elephant too because 
I went into that shoot thinking like elephants are playful and affectionate and like my elephant is going to be um, that way. And then I saw this other image, what I'm now looking at across the, the, um, the room and I even thought about redoing the elephant all over again to make it what I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. And instead I was just like, no, I can't get that one out of my head now. So that's kind of how it is. I can't get it out of my head once I've seen that one. Sure. What, in your mind, what is the purpose of uh, the artist in our uh, society and in our world? And we'll start with you, Jean. Well, there was a, a quote that I ran across uh, by an, another artist that, if I can paraphrase it and remember it, it was like, um, the job of an artist is not to get people to um, look at your work, but the job of the artist is to get people to see. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between looking and seeing things. And I can almost I can relate back to, you know, I was an art teacher of 30 years, and and I feel the job of my, of me as a teacher, uh, to get the students to see and not take for granted what's out there in the environment. Uh, a tree is not a tree is not a tree. Everything is different, um, and if you take a closer look at things. Um, you know, I used to borrow the, the mic, all the microscopes from the biology department, and we would start to really dissect the, uh, the natural uh, things that I had brought or they had brought in front of them and see how they can um, use that in their work. And so then when they see a piece in a, a museum or a gallery that is an abstraction, they don't say, that's strange. I don't understand it. But if they knew that the process that that artist might have gone through to get to that final piece, that it actually came from a, a, a natural element that was enlarged or twisted or turned or added to or whatever, then they would understand that. And then they also um, get a wider um, excitement about you know the world or, around them. And so I think that that is my job, uh, well, that was my job as an art teacher and as an artist because knowing that uh, when they grow up, they will influence their children and if they can get their children as excited about art, visual performing or whatever around them, uh, then I was successful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in my job. And so do you feel if I'm hearing you correctly, that your uh, purpose or mission or goal as a practicing artist is the same as it was when you were an art educator? I think so. I think so, yeah. Uh, I've always been a proponent of the, of the arts, and, and, and it's hard for, to get sometimes people to understand how, much, how important it is that they ex um, they can express themselves uh, and what that does to the person and how good they feel about themselves. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you have uh, little kids, and I've, I've taught all the way from first through 12, um, they have so much excitement about discovery and, and the in the arts, and, and they, you know, they come down to my classroom with these smiles and the excitement of, the, of what they were going to do today. And then when they get a little bit older, I, I think that's true of anybody. You get into the junior high, they they don't feel so sure about themselves or what they can do. They get tighter and so forth. And and to keep that freshness and imagination all the way through to graduation to what. Uh, what they're capable, you know that you have been successful and they'll carry that on into adulthood uh, about, uh, about the world around them. Um, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So, 
Shelby, how about you? Well, I want to jump off on what Jean said, because this idea of the excitement, feeling excited about the world, I think mm -hmm. is what you said. And I hope, and you said the world around us. And I hope that when people en are enjoying my work, there is a sense of excitement. And, um, and you talked about staying imaginative and creative. And I think that that, I can speak for myself, and, and I think other people may feel this way right now, too, that it's been a rough few years in our world, and um, that this sense of feeling alive and sort of excited and playful is, is a little hard to come by. And um, I, I get a little bit of that for myself when I make the work. So I hope that, that it does you know, wake that up for, for other people, and it makes me happy when people talk about how the work has like made them feel something, then I get that energy back. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that's a big part of it. And then I also see my work, and I think yours as well, as being accessible. That you can, you can come into the conversation just thinking, wow, that's an amazing transformation. How'd she do that? Or it might be that people you know, will write me and say, you know, it made me think about an experience I'd had with that animal or that kind of place. Or to me, it speaks to, you know, the shared fate that we have with other living things in a crisis. Or someone will say, to me, as a middle-aged woman like you, it makes me think about um, the power that I have and how I present myself and regard myself. Like, there's so many different ways people might bring meaning to the work. And I, for me as an artist, I value that. Um, that openness to to finding different meanings within within the pieces. You know, sometimes when I when I answer your questions, I always revert back to my profession. But as an art teacher, but when my students finished their work, they knew that they had to um, write artist statements about mm. their work, each problem that they had solved, and then we'd have a um, a jam session where they would present their work. They'd read their artist statement about their piece of work, and uh, then they'd uh, I'd entertain questions or, or or comments from the the rest of the students. And I would say, now make sure that, you know you don't just say, "I like your work." Yeah. You explain to the artist who did it that you're talking about why you why you like it. And uh, uh, you know the the reasons, are, and what do you see in the work? What what's what what is it meaning to you? And and the person, so it's really kind of an interesting thing. And uh, so they always enjoyed that kind of session. They knew they had to talk about their work, mm -hmm. and they knew that they were going to hear other people talk about their work. But they had to feel comfortable about it, and they had to make them feel comfortable about about what they were saying. And plus, they. They probably also enjoyed the root beer floats and things like that. <laughs> I, I would serve at the at the sessions. Uh, so uh, it's getting people, uh, getting students to and anybody else uh, to talk freely mm -hmm. about what they see. It's not easy. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy for someone to talk about their own work or talk about somebody mm -hmm. else's work and put it into words. Um, it sounds like a critique, but you called it a jam session. Yeah, uh, yeah well, in, in, I also, yeah, it was yeah. a critique. Yeah, yeah, it but was a critique. I, I'm wondering now yeah. how, how different the world would be if we just all called critiques jam sessions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they feel, but they, they always knew that when they finished something, that was, the, that was the next step. You know, they had to go down to the computer lab, type up their artist statement, give a title to their piece, and, and then talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, playful came up, uh, I think, um, just now a bit. And I would agree that the work, uh, and you said accessible, I think. And it is very accessible and very playful. And there's a, a certain degree of, of whimsy, maybe, if I, if I could say that. But um, there's more for both of you. I mean, it, it, it is very layered. And I don't know, darkness is probably not the right word. I think that's right. Um, I would say a couple things. I mean, one is that in my work, I am these hybrid creatures. But there is real tension in our relationship with the natural world right now. So many people have told me 
that they feel when they look at the work, a kind of something is really engaging, but also not quite, there's something, there's some kind of tension or there's some kind of uncanny valley where we're both seeing this, this creature and there's something unsettling at times about some of the images. And I take that as, well, we are in a sort of um, paradoxical relationship with the natural world where we're both deeply interconnected and yet at the same time there is this incredible distance growing between our species and all others in terms of our our impact. So I think it's both the nature of the, the, the very weirdness of the work of trying to transform my own self into another creature has an inherent tension. I think the moment we're in is tension. And then I've also feel that, as I said, I took a period off from the work um, for over a year at the start of the pandemic. And when I came back to it, I'm not sure I was in the same place. You know, some, sometimes there's, there's felt to me more of a intensity or, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say confrontationalness, but I would say a kind of um, grief in myself that I think um, can't help but come through in the work. And again, it's not one of those things that has to be forced. It just kind of, um, I just see it when I see some of the more recent images that there is a kind of, um, a sort of fed upness mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. about, um, a, a, about a few different situations um, facing, facing humanity right now. And I think that if it didn't have any of that, it wouldn't be the work for this moment. You know, it wouldn't feel, wouldn't feel right. It, your work has got a different kind of a, oh, it's a mystery about your things. And in my work, it's kind of, uh, I always uh, have a bit of humor in my, in my pieces. But the humor also says something about possibly the woman who might be uh, owning or wearing that piece. And, that's, uh, and I've always thought of any of my pieces that I made are, are wearable, and what mm-hmm. woman would choose to wear those, and what is it says, uh, said about her character. Um, so even though that might think of my pieces as being sculptural or painterly-like if they hang on the wall, I often think that, you know, they can be worn. And, uh, you know, the the clothes don't necessarily make the person. The person is already made. The woman is already made. It, 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 the clothes that she wears helps to make the statement about that woman. Uh, not everybody would wear these kind of pieces and what woman would. Uh, then you start to think about her personality or what she's confronting at that time and so forth. And May so, I add to that? Please. Yeah, I think this is fascinating. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I'm drawn to Jean's work. Because as women, we're often given such a narrow range of available self-expression. And, you know, I, I routinely feel that no clothes particularly express anything real about me at all. And it, that Jean has sort of reimagined the depth and, and uh, range of what a woman truly might have to express. Um, I think that's very powerful. When I title my pieces, the title is extremely important. And I, I work on that a lot, and I tweak different words until I have it the way I want it to be. And he and, and not he, but she and her always have to appear somewhere mm. in, my, in my title. Um, so it kind of expresses the, oh, the experience of that person at that time, what, what's happening to her, um, or some memory back in my time. Like, for example, the, my hat that is uh, uh, an anteater. Uh, it has a, uh, when, I, when I bought the piece, it had this long uh, hair or tail-like form uh, on it. And so I was thinking about animals that might be that way, and, and somehow I, I worked my way into an anteater. But then I also thought back when I was a child, when I was real young, I had long hair. But when I was in, 
my elementary grades, I had short hair. And I always envied the, the girls in my class that had long hair and they could put it into a ponytail. So that's how eventually the title, Long Enough for a Ponytail, ended up on my hat that was an anteater. So I'm associating things from my past uh, sometimes into my, into my pieces, and sometimes they aren't. Uh, I don't know. I, it's just hard to say how I end up in, like, uh, my driving cap, uh, what happened when you driving a, her red convertible. Well, then you begin to think, well, what kind of woman is driving a red convertible? You know, so you, you count, it, it brings back, you kind of figure out the personality of the woman that would possess those. And, and then what happens, uh, and so when I, I'm kind of meandering on and along here, <laughs> but uh, um, the hat, uh, I went back to looking at hats that um, women wore back in time when you had the open roadsters and there was not a covering on, on the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they wore sometimes protective clothing to keep them from uh, uh, rain, dirt, bugs, and things like that. You know what the front of the radiator looks like on the car. Yeah. And so then that, that's how my, that was my thought process to the woman that would be wearing that and what happened when she uh, wore the hat that the bugs that uh, that were protected, and they landed on the hat instead of the grill. And, and, and so that was a kind of a long explanation for that, and I kind of went round and round and round, but uh, I find anyway. It, I find it interesting because I was going to share, I wanted to share this, that so my, um, my grandmother and great-grandmother worked in women's fashion. So my great-grandmother made and sold women's hats. My grandmother um, sold, ran like a dress shop in a small town in Kentucky. My mother grew up in the dress shop. So for them, you know, these questions of um, what is the meaning of clothing and the value of clothing in a time when each piece of clothing, you know, came from somewhere. You know, you mm -hmm. went to, you went to um, Chicago. You know, my grandmother would go to Chicago to, to look at what was going to come into her store. There was such a rela relationship for women and clothes, and that was their livelihood too. So mm -hmm. that was also how they gained independence as um, women businesswomen. So mm -hmm. I love your work, and I love its connection to that history of of eras of women's fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and someone might ask me, well, whenever I do my pieces, especially my garments, uh, I do the front and the and the back. You know, they might say, well, why do you do the back? No one, you know, it's hanging on the wall, but my garment could be wearable. And so a woman always likes to see herself coming and going. <laughs> so, you know, why not uh, do, do the back? It just, it, it seemed like it was not complete if it was not done, done in the round. Uh, so anyway, I was uh, relate back to uh, the woman can can wear these pieces. Mm -hmm. it, it, um, it sounds like there's a, a good degree of um, autobiographical uh, weaving in, if you will, uh, into your pieces, but sometimes they deviate. I mean, does every piece have some bit of, your, of a self-portrait in it? Yeah, I, I would think so. Whether it's a self-portrait of of me or what I think of a self-portrait of a other another woman okay. would be, you know, not they aren't necessarily always of me. Uh, say, for example, the uh, if I always have to refer to a, a piece, uh, been living in a beehive. I, a lot of my ideas go back to when I was younger, in the forties to the sixties. And so that was a period of time when the beehives were uh, hairdos. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I never myself had a beehive hairdo, but I had friends that probably did or knew of people or whatever. And so then the, there was a thought, well, I, I, somehow I vaguely remember someone saying, though, you, you know, spiders live in the, in the beehive or whatever. What's in, what's in the beehive? 
Uh, and uh, so I thought, well, the hat I had had, well, had a beehive shape and the bulge up on top. And so then I thought, well, maybe there could be, if, if spiders lived in the beehive, creatures could live there too. And, and, and going back to uh, when I talk about the beehive and, uh, to people, back then their hair was, you know, they used to wrap uh, toilet tissue or paper around, I mean, it was to preserve them when they're sleeping. So the next yeah. day the, that, that dome still was, was really nice. And so uh, I thought, well, what other kind of creatures could live there? And I came up with, I went to the library again to, to research animals or creatures that the smallest one, the size of the hand or less, it had to be tiny, could be living up there possibility. And ran across the tarsier, and most people don't know what a tarsier is, but it's one of the smallest of the primates. And uh, so that's how, that was my thought process in order to get to what animal would be the size that could possibly pop out of that. And sure. So anyway, then I, then I'm off. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> off running. Uh, then I had to figure out, well, what's my, how am I going to work with the fiber mm -hmm. to uh, imitate what I wanted to do? And uh, so the rest is history. And it shall be yours start quite literally with, I mean, you're photographing yourself. How much of it, I mean, do you see yourself in these photographs? Are, are they self-portraits at any level mm. or are you simply a canvas? I think what would often make them hard for even me to define is that on the one hand, there's so much of me in them. I mean, in my spirit and my energy and what I'm thinking about, you know, what I'm interested in, it's all there. And yet at the same time, they're, they truly are hybrid. I mean, they truly are two things at once. So they are meant to be, you know, studies and evocations of these creatures. Um, but I think there's a genuine feeling. I think the feeling that you see when I'm making the work is what I really felt when I was making them. And to some extent, the freedom of it is being able to say, I contain multitudes, right? Mm -hmm. We all do. And that there is this um, capacity to be so many um, feelings and ways of presenting oneself. And I, and I don't have to say that those are portraits of who I am for all time. Those, that was that, that moment or that session, there was something that came up for me as I was making the piece. And you see what came up for me at that moment. And I do think as a woman, um, even if these aren't self-portraiture in a certain sense, they're connected to that history of how women um, present ourselves and more often in art how we are presented by others. So in that sense, I think it is relevant to say what has been the history of women in portraiture more generally and what has been um, even these sort of contemporary um, expectations of casual self-portraiture. How, how am I supposed to photograph myself for Instagram? Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is um, saying something different about um, the power and acceptability of dramatically blowing up expectations of how we appear and how, we're, how we are allowed to appear. What's the most challenging aspect of working as an artist? Hmm. Let's see. Maybe it's all fun. Because <laughs> 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 it, it's very frustrating. So I, uh, it seems like the best time I, when I uh, get ideas or whatever is uh, probably when I'm trying to get go to sleep. Mm. Mm. So that's the most, uh, you know, to to come up with the idea, and it's it's like a light bulb, and and just be happy with it. Um, I don't know, it, 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 it's, it's tough to do. Uh, sometimes in, uh, challenging as an artist, 
I don't know what to, how to answer that other than it's just a, it's, it's just a process. And when I get all done, I, I'm happy about it, but about my own work. But what's enjoyable for me is to see somebody else, uh, watch somebody else kind of in, in, um, look at my piece and smile and you know, and really study and, and talk about it to somebody else with them or, or whatever. I get, uh, that's how I feel. I feel happy. I, I feel good that they in, enjoyed the piece. And I guess that was my, what was the question? <laughs> yeah. What's the What's the most challenging aspect? Oh, I, I mean, I uh, actually answered that question. Yeah. Oh. Well, maybe challenging to get people uh, to engage with my piece. Uh, I can answer it that way. You know, you can. Uh, that's what's challenging to. Would it be fair to say uh, um, the competition for attention is is challenging? I mean, it's hard to get people's attention with with the amount of um, visual culture that that we're um, competing with. Is is that certainly certainly is? Um, I think even the the young well, it's. It's it's a um, it goes both ways. Sometimes the younger people are more engaged, or they can be more distracted and not be engaged so much at at this work. Uh, um, I don't I don't know. It's it's uh, when I was when I was teaching one of the most fun parts of my job was in the spring when I took my kids up to the Twin Cities for a trip. So I wanted to keep them in, in, engaged in art and what was out there. And so we'd, uh, we'd get into the museums and the galleries and the studios and so forth. And uh, that, that, was, that was where they, they seem to really come alive and, and, and enjoy what was out there. So that was that was one of the most fun days for me of the whole year because I could I could see what the expressions of the other and they'd never been in these in these places. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of there was all kinds of <laughs> so, wonderful so. things in there anyway. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, Shelby, how about for you? Yeah. Well, I, I think I laughed slightly when you said, like, it's all yeah. fun. Because yeah. it's like, well, this is a pretty incredible privilege, you know, to be in a position, um, you know, economically, to be in good health, to be able to devote time to art is um, something I'm really grateful for. And it, it is work sometimes, right? Like, so I think if a piece is becoming a grind, like if I really feel like I'm just grinding it out, that's, that probably is a sign it's not going the right way. There should be, for me, some amount of flow or, um, you know, you, something happening. You need to have fun with what you're Yeah, doing. yeah. You know, you, but it, it is like you have talked about work. Like you've talked about finding the, I'm not going to come up with the right word, but the sort of board on which you're stretching the canvas to mount the work, that there's always some part of it where you're, um, you're kind of in the, the final stretch of something and maybe, so I was thinking like there was this night where um, I was like five months pregnant. It, I think I may have even worked that day. I was still, still working part-time as an educator. And then I think I started painting at like three o'clock and at 11, I was still in the studio, five months pregnant, covered in paint, becoming the blue, blue ringed octopus. And like, I was, I was like, is this gonna work? This is one of my favorite pieces. And I was thinking, is this gonna work? Like, is this, is this line, is this working in the way it's supposed to? And I thought, I'm still here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You know, like, there are times where you're like, I'm in the last, you know, one artist said to me once, that last 10%, is often the most important to going from it's almost working to it's working, and so I think there's always that um, that that like part where you're saying this is work now. I have, I'm really committed to seeing this through, 
Um, I think also I would say like a shout out to everyone who is juggling something else, which is pretty much everyone, right? Because I know for me, like, um, I was looking back getting ready for this talk on like the last um, five or so years of reference photos and things that inspired me. And I realized, gosh, this has gone through planning to start a family, being pregnant, having my child as a newborn, um, you know, infancy, a pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, but still dealing with sort of this sort of post-pandemic world in which I'm parenting. Um, you know, a child who's still too young to be vaccinated. Like, there is a lot going on in my life, and I think in everyone's life beyond art making and, and being in the world of art. And um, I have been in, still, still in a position of, of privilege in being able to continue making the work, but very much thinking about how do we, um, how do we make a narrative of what it really means to make work in the time you have. And like you make the work you have with the time you have and valuing that. So that's sometimes my challenge is saying, how do I keep the work alive and keep my spirit for the work alive um, with a life full of other, other things that are happening too? Well, I'm retired, so I have more time. But I, I wouldn't enjoy my piece if I felt like I had to constantly all day long work on that. Right. I've got to, you know, be doing uh, other things that I enjoy. Uh, otherwise, it, it becomes work and it doesn't, and it's not fun. So that's why my things do take, a, well, my process is long anyway, but it, it's, I'm not constantly working at it. I, when I was teaching, uh, I didn't work on it so much during the school year, I didn't have the time, and so I spent a little bit more time in the in the summertime on my work, and so um, now I'm able to pick it up any time that I want um, to work on it. But I, I, I don't. Maybe it's because I haven't had what you call necessary deadlines where I had you know this crunch, and then then if I had those deadlines, then it wouldn't be, become so much fun for me anymore. Um, I'm working for a deadline rather than working for trying to solve uh, and have fun with what I'm, what I'm doing, Pete, so. I like what you said about joy, too, because I feel like in this talk, I've talked a lot about what is not, you know, the challenges of the last few years, but also saying, like, the time I spend with my family is joyful, mm -hmm. or the time that you spend in your garden, like, these things mm -hmm. are joyful and nourishing, and they make our work able to be creative and joyful, and that that, that has real value. Shelby, Jean, thank you so much for sharing your work with our community. Can you edit in something? <laughs> we can. <laughs> thank you, Jean. I, I have this thing in this box here. Sure. <laughs> so I don't know how you can work it into your thing, but I feel like I need, they, you know, yeah. I could have worked it into any of the questions that we had before. It's all good. <laughs> so anyway, this, well, when you talk about nature and that uh, a discovery, this is something that I always uh, would show my uh, students, uh, maybe the first day of school, for them to uh, become familiar with the environment around themselves. Did you really notice? And I, I found this bone in uh, what they call uh, Beaver Creek by Redwood Falls. And uh, so anyway, uh, it's, uh, it says a lot about my work in that you can look at a piece and it looks like a hat, but then you can look, and you can look at a piece and it, it looks entirely different or it could be taking a whole new meaning. And, and so when I hold this up to my students, you know, they, well, you know what is this? Oh, it's, it's a bone. Okay, yeah, that's a bone. And why do you know it's a bone? And what, then you have discussions about um, where do you think it came? Well, first of all, what animal could it be from? And so we talk about what animal. Uh, what part of the body do you think it might be? Okay, and they, they kind of thought maybe it's a vertebrae or something like that after discussing it. And then after that, well, okay, what happens if you do this? Okay, um, what's it look like then? And then they start to 
go away from it's a bone to associate it with something else. Like uh, in this case, uh, some might say, well, my husband says it looks like an owl. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay. You know. So, and that's why uh, when I work with some of my pieces, I, I begin to see something else and that's the, pro that's the same process. And so that sometimes, you know, when they look at something, they may go through that same process of, well, it's not a bone, it can be something else in their work. And so then when I turn it like this, okay, hmm. now what's, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and, okay, well, it sort of looks like a, another kind of creature. Yeah. Okay, what, what kind of personality does, does, that, that, does this one have that this one, you know, mm. has? And so, so you're talking about something, you know, totally different than uh, what it was, you know, originally. A matter so, of change perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, that can be said of anything, you know, uh, we never talked about artists that we were uh, uh, inspired by, but I was always inspired by some of the artists that uh, uh, dislocated their, uh, this no longer is in the, the riverbed that I found it. Mm. It's on uh, someplace else. Uh, or, or something, uh, some artists uh, have a tendency to, uh, the ones that I'm inspired by, uh, float things in the air, levitation, or uh, some other kind of um, uh, different perspective, or uh, something that might have been a, a, a plant in a, in a pot, all, all of a sudden becomes uh, the flowers on, on the wall, like Matisse did with his still lives. Uh, some of, and so those are the kind of things that inspired me, and I never even talk, mentioned Salvador Dali, you know, the, the surrealist and that, but, uh, or Henri Rousseau with his mystery jungle themes. Um, so that's, uh, uh, and uh, well, I don't know where this could fit into uh, your thing, but one thing that it goes back to what we were discovering to get people to look at something. Uh, another artist that inspired me was uh, Jerry Rudquist, mm -hmm. uh, the um, painting professor from McAllister. And I would always show my students his video on the, the painted eye, which is, anybody could have become excited about color after watching that video and my kids would about color mixings and so forth. And something that would always kind of stay in my mind, uh, he uh, did a portrait of his daughter, Monica Redquist, who's a potter in her own right, and he, ch he showed that portrait. But there was another fr picture hanging alongside that portrait that had a ponytail. And so someone asked him, well, why did you do that? And people might think it had some kind of deep meaning that he split the two up. But his explanation for the ponytail over here was just that he didn't have room enough <laughs> on his portrait. And so, but then it made you look at that piece and, and it caused a dialogue between that piece and you about why he did that. And so he was successful, but it was just a simple explanation rather than a deep, deep meaning. Uh, so... Um, a sense of the unexpected and transformation, mm -hmm. which I think is an apt description for both of your works, your bodies of work, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Marvelous. Shelby, did you want to share any inspirations or, or artists that artists. have influenced you? Sure. So um, even though my work is very different, I look at artists like Cindy Sherman, Carrie Mae Weems, Claude Cahoon. So looking at um, women and non-binary people who have been using transformation and using themselves as um, the performer the, um, in ways that have been surprising and unexpected. 
and um, and that raise questions and and um, also and just on a different on a sort of much more practical level. I often am so impressed with how resourceful these artists have been. You know, what they've been able to do with, um, in some cases, you know, relatively um, simple and non-fantastical props or settings. I mean, what Carrie Mae Weems was able to do around the kitchen table is extraordinary. So there's also, um, looking back at the sort of levels of resourcefulness, inventiveness, creativity that um, artists before me have put into this project of, of transformation and um, of, of I, I think illusion might be too strong a word for some of those artists, but that there is this kind of moment of um, you believe something that, that isn't real or that is, wasn't, that didn't really happen or that um, um, we're in, in the case of Cindy Sherman's work, there is that, again, that uncanny valley where um, I once tried recreating her, her work just as, a, as an exercise, um, like a class exercise, and I was blown away by how contrived I felt, you know, becoming these um, archetypal women from cinema. And I think that her work, even if you've never tried to recreate it, just to view it, you get that sense of something about this um, transformation doesn't quite fit. I think my work is more fluid. There's more about interconnection and the, the, the feeling of closeness with other living things. Her work is about, to some extent, the distance between um, real women and, and these um, stereotypes types or, or visions. But the fact that she's able to communicate without any words that tension and distance is a very subtle kind of transformation, a very subtle modulation of transformation that um, I find I find very compelling. Another, uh, still, other artists that interest me, Mark Chagall, uh, the the type of things that he did in his paintings. Uh, yeah. um, another period that inspired me, especially. Uh, the Walker brought that in as a show many, many years ago, the biomorphic time between the 40s and the 60s. Uh, the painters, the sculptors, the designers, uh, the furniture, the, where, where the organic form uh, was used a lot, uh, down to uh, not only the, the clothes that uh, women wore, but the, the dishes, the potato chip bowl, the, all these other kinds of things that were organic or they go back to their source was, was nature somehow, but changed it a little bit into this uh, bio form. Uh, that was an inspiration uh, to me, too. Thank you so much for sharing the how and why you do what you do. Thank and you now, for having us here, Jim. It's such an honor we'll, to be here. I know we'll go home and we'll say, I never said this and I never said that. <laughs> so I forgot this. And Me too. I could have inserted this or whatever. I know that'll come to mind. Sure. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. We did. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Jim. We've been speaking with Jean Haughton and Shelby Meyerhoff about their exhibition Beyond and Bizarre Natural Illusions on view in the Red Penning Gallery at the Hopkins Center for the Arts, June 23rd through July 30th, 2022.